as a professional, I don't, as I always require the, uh, the people who hire me to provide the timber. And I hear what they bring me. And the reason I do this is that there's so much difference in timber and so many troubles involved in timbers cracking and timbers not being big enough and that I hew other people's wood. And these fellows have been very nice. They felled it for me and everything. I can fall trees, but I hate to do it. I sort of, ad sort of advise people of uh, what they should give me and also, if somebody else has provided the material, I get to complain about it. If I provide it, they get to complain about it. So this, I want you to notice, is uh, not a log, but a tree. And there's the top of the tree. And there's the bottom. And I asked them to try and keep it on the stump if they could. And as you see, with all those limbs down there, this tree can't possibly move. And the hardest part, once you've learned to hew, the one most difficult thing to do is to keep the log from moving after you've started. And if you leave the top on it, the farmers were smart, it can't move. And so what you get to do is you get to hew two sides. Now this, this log here has been, has been angled, cut for felling it. So our beam's not gonna start here. It's gonna start back here somewhere. So we're gonna lose about seven inches. So we gotta add that when we're done. So let's see where 18 feet takes us. All right, here's 18 feet. There's seven inches for the, the shave off at the butt there. And now we need about 12 more to, uh, but I don't, wanna, I don't wanna work here if I don't have to. So we're gonna cut it right about there. We're gonna call that 18 feet. Now this here is a string. And I'm gonna loop it over one of these high nails. And I'm running a string right down the middle. You see all trees, being as how this tree took 40 or 50 years to get this big, it's very comfortable with its shape. And because it is comfortable with its shape, it looks straight, but it's not. Trees always look straighter than they are, because trees are natural, and natural things look right, but it's not. So now I'm looking down this string, and this is gonna tell me more or less where the center of strength is in this tree. I want, my, I want the strongest beam I can get. The reason why I have long nails here is so that I can knock this string over to the left or over to the right as it pleases me to find that center of strength, that place where the beam should lie tree-wise. And I've hit it right on by accident, so I don't have to do much adjusting at all. Well, the next step is to find where our eight inches go. And I'm going to use this string and this tape. And it may as well be level. Don't suppose it has to be, but it may as well be. And now I'm going to find a vertical right down from four inches. And it's just about there and that's where my nail is going to go and my nail has to be vertical as well because these nails I can't bang back and forth very much because I got to slide my chalk line up and down on them to find the best place to make a mark on the tree so I want these nails to be substantial and more or less vertical if the tree was straight, then I would be looking for the center of it. But since the tree is not straight, it has weak places and strong places, which means I'm looking for a kind of a compromise. 
In other words, if there's a bad place, I'm going to want to be in the center of that bad place because then the beam will be stronger. This tree is pretty good. So now we have our sort of center of strength here. And now we have our eight inch beam lined out. Not lined out, but set out anyhow. Now I'm gonna do the same thing here. You wanna hold this one? And I'm gonna run this string, same thing, running up the tree, butt to, uh, butt to top, like this. Now I have a habit of always wrapping my strings to the outside of the nail. See, it's on the outside of the nail. That way I never forget, because nails have thickness and that can throw your line. Now, I don't need the middle line anymore. I've done with it. So now I can use this string out here. So now if we've done this right, these strings are eight inches apart, aren't they? Let's just see if they are. All right, that's a hair under. They gotta go a little wider. So I take a look and I say, okay, which side, which side can sacrifice a little? The answer is neither, but we'll tap that one out a hair. Because we gotta tap one or the other out. Okay, now we tap this one out of here. This tree is not big enough, but it's bigger than uh, the ones in the basement. And the smaller it is, the easier my work is. All right, this has to go out too. So again, I take a look and I say, oh yeah, this tree's bellied out there in the middle. Which way can I sacrifice a little bit? I guess it better be here. Now, the trick is to turn one of these strings into a chalk line. I'm gonna make a place for this line to hit, for starters. I'm gonna go way out here. I don't wanna drop chalk on the tree. Chuck lines are awful tricky. See, now this is also going to the outside of the nail. We're being very careful not to make any little snappy motions because we don't want to snap this line early. That's for sure. This is gonna be a bad one. Now the idea is to pull this chalk line straight up in the air and drop it straight down. And the theory is it'll make a line underneath it. But I know it's not going to work. And I know one way to make it work a little better, which is to figure out where it ought to hit. And it ought to hit right about there. So I'm going to take one hand and I'm going to hold it right down where I know is correct and I'm going to snap it in two pieces. And now you see we've got a fine little blue line. And I guess we're free to believe that that line is straight. But I know better because <laughs> I've been here before. So what we do is we check it in a few places and see if it's where it ought to be. Very good, it's very good right here. Okay, you can't trust a chalk line on a round surface. But as long as you know how to check it, you can't go wrong as long as you're willing to believe it. It's like being lost in the woods and saying, this compass must be wrong. Happens to me all the time. So now we have our line. Now we need our ax. And what we have to do is score to the line, oh, about every eight inches. That's always been traditional. You measured them, right? You got nine? Yeah, between eight and 10 inches. Between eight so. and 10, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here's the trick, is, uh, I should get rid of this line, but I guess I'll live with it for now, is uh, you can't have knots 
on the pieces that you split out. So you have to score out your knots. So what I do is I score out the knots, which doesn't make for easy chopping, but you see that knot right there. And then what you do is you got this space between the knots and you say, can I get away with one score or do I have to score twice? And that's where it depends on where you want, do, you want to do most of your work. You can be lazy here and work harder later or you can do your work here and be lazy later. But these are the easy ones. So here's a tree all scored. Now the fun thing about hewing with the top and the stump attached is that you never have a log. You're never turning a log into a timber. At some point in the process, the tree becomes a beam, but it's never been a log. I've got to go find a different ax. Are you trying to score the timber so, so that you have a flat surface now, or is that something that, that you'll deal with later? Yes and no. What, what I've done is, uh, is I have scored it so that the score marks are a little bit out at the bottom. Okay. Because if they were in at the bottom, I'd be all finished because once, once the, uh, any, any wood that gets beyond this line is now gone forever and can't be put back. Mm -hmm. So I always try to hew, just, just thank you, just a little bit out that way. And I can test that with my plumb bob. And I can use this to check my score marks and see if they're straight up and down. Is that pretty good? Notice I got about three quarters of an inch from the line to the string and down there I got about a half inch. So I'm out a quarter inch and that's what I want to be. This one I've scored deep because this is the end of the log. Mm -hmm. So if I want to, and the first two beams I did, I did this a lot. See how that's out? They're all out just a little bit. This is how I get along with only one line. The other line is theoretical and it's directly below the blue line in a vertical plane. And this string defines the vertical plane. So I got my straight line and I got my vertical and that's all I need to do to make one side perfectly flat, mm -hmm. which is impossible. But we get as close as we can. And we're going to do your best. Aaron. But we're going to do our best. Now watch yeah. out for the death quad, right. you guys. Okay. Now, the trick to hewing is the approach of the chip. I'm just making a place now. I'm not hewing now. I'm just making myself a place. Because I want to get right in here, see? And I don't want the wood affecting my axe. So I'm making a spot from which I can approach that first chip. Now, you're starting uh, toward the top of, of the timber that you're trying yeah, to Yeah, that's because I'm left-handed. Okay, it do, but it doesn't have to do with necessarily with the grain or the configuration well, of the grain in the Well, it's tree. easier. It's okay. easier to go from the top down. Okay. And because I'm only doing one side for the camera, I have chosen this way. <laughs> but when I do the other side, I gotta go from the, the bottom we'll up. We'll start on the other and side. And I'll do that by myself where I can swear. All right. Okay. <laughs> Remember, we're at Shaker Village. So. That's right. That one's not very good. So 
so we'll sort of leave it and approach the next one. Now you see that knot? That's why I chopped that knot out because I don't want that knot in the middle of a, of a place. Now you see those two cuts there? Those are your preparatory cuts. They're the ones giving me a place to get in. Now I, I could have done a better job on this one. It's way out if I wanted to or if I'd been able to or what have you. But now it's behind me. Now all I care about is this one. That's perfect. And sometimes you can get it going just right. Preparing. We're at the butt now. And when you get towards the butt, the wood gets tougher. I'm gonna stop here and leave you one loaf of bread there so that when we're done with this you can look at it and see the whole process so that's the rough ewing and the next process is the rough trimming and you use a trimming axe for that this is known as a broad axe this is an old one, of course the best ones are. You can see that black mark there. The edge is steel welded into an iron, an iron axe. It's uh, very, very sharp and very, very thin where it does the work. It's an interesting grind. It's a little thick here because this is the point that you kind of have to use to lop off a knot. You come to these knots you kind of hit them down here, you need it thick down here. In here, it's quite thin. And that's the part that you use to shave off your shavings. It gets thick again up here, because that's where it hits the ground once in a while. Mm -hmm. And so, when I got this at the flea market, it was kind of like that. And I reground it all perfect. And I think I hewed maybe two or three trees, and it was right back to the way it was. It had chipped here a little bit and was now thicker and mm -hmm. had folded here a bit. Mm -hmm. It's a very, you're asking a lot of steel to uh, be a broad axe, to, to do this kind of a job. But let's see the job first. And, mm -hmm. and we'll, we'll be a long time at this and you'll see the axe in work. Mm -hmm. And what I want to do is I want to hew to the line. I want my blue line roughly in the right place but I don't care what's below it. Well, you know, I'll trust my eye a little bit. Axe cuts like a knife. It's a kind of a double stroke. And the roundness of this edge apes that. It's almost like a power cheese, slice, cheese slicer at the deli. There's a lot of pull to it. There's a lot of cutting. And if you don't score deep enough, you can't do this. It, uh, any place the scoring isn't deep enough, the work is a whole lot harder. So you couldn't, you couldn't chop down and hit this line right on. You have to kind of carve it out from the, the long way. That way you get it just right, you can move along the line. We need to keep as much of that line as possible so we can use it for squaring up the side. Come on. And these things have to be kept awful sharp. It's just, they gotta be as sharp as your pocket knife. There's no compromise on that. Now, Dan, you're using your axe with the beveled side to, to yeah. your work. Now, yeah. if I were to just pick up a broad axe and look at it, yeah. I would sure think that that was backwards. I did, too, for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had old timers apologizing to me for using the bevel in. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the history of the broad axe is old enough now 
so that even the people who were alive when I was a kid learning this didn't really, they were farmers who were occasionally replacing a floor joist in the barn. Mm -hmm. They weren't hewing beams to make buildings. Those, that was all done a hundred years ago. And they really didn't have a straight line of learning and knowledge mm -hmm. from the uh, broad axe. They all used it bevel side in. I thought I had to use it flat side too. Yes. Uh, it doesn't work that way. It uh, sticks. It's just like a, uh, like a chisel. Unless you're, you're working an absolutely flat surface and only planing or cutting end grain, mm -hmm. it, uh, it goes in. So the way I look at it is this, is the reason you have a flat side is because a flat sided tool has a thinner edge. Okay, here's an ax. All right. Now you make one side flat, okay, and your edge is that much thinner. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think it's all about. I see. Yeah. And as I look at the beams in the basement of the uh, syrup house and all the other beams I've ever seen in my life, they've all been done. They all have these kind of cuts on them. And these mm -hmm. cuts are so made. It's a, somewhat of a concave surface. That's right, where, where because this cut. is round and it, yes. and it's out. Mm -hmm. then you get that kind of concave cut. Now I can show you what happens when you do that. Do it this way. Is uh, cuz I I've used it this way many times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that it's sticking and it seems to pull itself into the timber more yeah. more so than than it you pulls itself wish. in and you mm -hmm. wind up undercut. Yes. You've got to be real careful to hold it out. It's, it's a real wrestling mm -hmm. match. Yeah. So that's, you may have that cut forever. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that may be inside. I don't know. Mm -hmm. See how, see how right. it went. There are 19th century uh, cast steel broad axes yes. that are absolutely flat on one side. I mean, they're mm -hmm. the whole thing. They're, just like a, yes, the I head of an a, engine. I have a hatchet that I use for yeah. trimming that's just that way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I guess they have their uses, mm -hmm. but uh, I I've, I've put them together and ground them and tried to use them. More knots. See, this tree really should have ended probably there. As we're coming up towards the top now, of course, this is the real end. It gets kind of worse and worse. All right. So, this is rough. This is rough. And I'm going to leave it rough about to here. Let me get a piece of chalk. So now we can use the plumb bob and the chalk. And I'm going to start about here, and I'm going to mark all the high places. And here's a high place. That's okay. And there's a high place. And that's just where I want it. I want the high places at the bottom. Because as long as the bottom is high, I haven't ruined my timber. But what happens if the top gets high? Then I got a problem. See, the bottom's high, that's good. If the top gets high, it means the bottom's disappeared. Theoretically, this string should touch the entire side of the timber all the way down along with the line. I'm way out now at the bottom, which is good because it's just where I want to be. So what I've done here is I've marked all the high places, believing my string, and I'm going to leave a few for you. And I'm going to start trimming from this line. And here's our second trim. And now we're bringing it down more square. But the process of taking away all the high places, 
which we've marked. Make the marks and hew them out. I'm beginning to sort of see it. When you say a craftsman has a good eye, it's probably because he's gotten tired of doing just what I'm doing. He said, okay, I know what it's gonna be. So now, let me find where I put my chalk. We have here the second level of trimming. And now I'll mark again and we'll get us a third. Now there is perfect. It's perfect right here. It's touching the line and it's a hair out at the bottom. So now we're, now we're beginning to get places that are just right and will now be untouched, which makes the process go faster. But when I worked for the Historical Society of Dunbarton, I had a teacher named Octave Delude who knew his business. And by that time, I had decided once and for all that there was no way I was ever going to use a chalk line. And I told them. They ordered up, oh, 20 or 30 beams for the roofing, the roof structure of the old stone blacksmith shop, which is still there. It's the historical building. And I said to him, okay, but whatever length you want me to hew, you have to provide me with a straight plank, straight square plank that size. Because I'm going to put that plank on top of the tree and I'm going to trace it. <laughs> because that's the only way I know to get a straight line on a log. And uh, it was Octave Delude and the famous gardener, Mills. And they looked at each other and they nodded to each other. Now you see this one coming up? When the marks start to get high, I start to be finished. So they looked at each other and they said, well, they nodded, okay, I guess we can do that. And the day came, I had no car at the time, so Gardner drove me into the woods and there was Octave with, with his uh, toolbox. And we felled a tree and I looked around and there was no plank. And I said, where's my plank? And Octave said, well, he said, I guess we could get you a plank if you really thought you needed one, but... And he reached on into his toolbox and he pulled out these old chalk lines. Uh, they were chalk boxes like that silver one I used, but they were different size and shape and a lot older. And he said, I think we could, let's try. I said, okay, we can try. And he taught me this technique. I don't know where this is because the line's lost here and these ends are always bad. So you're gonna have to cut the ends off when the time comes. So he taught me this trick with the, uh, the level. So you knew and uh, holding it in one place and snapping it in two sections and redoing the ends because they're always off. And then he left me with his chalk lines and he went home and I hewed aside. I came to the next side and I got out the chalk lines and 45 minutes later, with tears streaming down my face, I finally had a line I could use. But it was murder. It was, it's not easy. So I'm gonna leave this and I'm gonna trim from here back. And this will be what, this our second or third trimming? We'll get it together when we go back to the beginning. Now take these marks off and we'll be just a little better. Okay, doesn't that look good? That looks good. It probably isn't. Shall we check it one more time? As long as we're so short now, it won't take a minute. But we get to the end, of course, we're into bad anyway. Ends are, ends are always a compromise. So let's leave it here. Oh, isn't that good? Uh, maybe a little here. You see, I shouldn't be doing this. This is too much. And when the minute you begin to feel, there, that's in the center, that could come. 
but that's okay for a rise in the center of a beam. So we're really at the point now where we really shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should just stop, huh? So let's back up and look at this log. So here's the tree, and it's attached to the stump here, and this is where we've scored. And now we've broken out the score, broken out between the scores, and this is rough hewn. And that's done with an ordinary wood pile axe. Now we have trimmed it by eye, maintaining the line, defining the line as best we can. And you can probably even see now that it's out at the bottom. It's sticking out at the bottom, which is what we wanted because it's safe. Now we've marked these high places, most of which are at the bottom, and now we've taken them out. And now it's a little flatter, but it's still sticking out at the bottom. We've marked it again, the high places, and taken them off, and now it's pretty near vertical. And that's the uh, evolution of the side. And all we need to do now is strike the line on the other side and score it, about two dozen scores on a log this size, and knock them off, and rough hew it, and trim it, and mark it, and trim it, and mark it, and trim it, and then we have two sides done. And I'm sure there's nothing you'd rather do than stand here in the cold and watch me do it, because it's wonderful fun. But it just so happens that since we have four logs to do, I have one over here in the woods that's all done to that stage. So let's take a walk. What it is now is a plank. It's a plank with round edges. And if you can look back up there, you'll see that it's still, it's still part of a tree. There's, it still has uh, the top of the trees right on it. And it can't go anywhere. And it's uh, real happy and real flat and real square. But now we got to deal with the top and the bottom, which means we got to turn it over. So we got to turn it over. And the reason I left this one loaf of bread here is because this right here is where it's attached to the stump. So I think what I'm going to do is just take that first and sort of pretend that I'm just ewing it and see what happens. But I don't know what's going to happen, so I might have to jump. Now working this, this first loaf of bread here is awful hard to get off. It's, uh, it's butt wood and it's tough and if you cut too far in it's uh, real bad news and so sometimes I kind of compromise it and take it about here and trim a bit more. But there we are and there's the grain. So let me just try one more time. Let's do this. See what happens. Well, that's dumb. Let's not do that. Let's do this. All right. Now, one of the ways to get work done that uh, isn't working is to try every possible way. And every possible way doesn't work, but by the time you're done, I think that might be loose. By the time you're done failing, the job is done. When I get through here, I want this to lay flat. So this is the time to introduce some timber underneath it. Now, you can hew a hundred logs with just three or four square pieces of wood. Because every one you finish you can get your wood back and use it for the next one. <clears throat> and 
nice, huh? And there's plenty of chips to level with. So you can start right in with whatever's handy here. But if you got these level, nice. And these sides are flat, they should lay so these sides can be done vertically. No, we have to sever the plank from the treetop. And I suppose we could have sawed it, but I thought it might be polite to stay with axes. And to say something about chopping through. Now, when you chop through, you need to cut deeper. And when you're working with axes, cutting deeper means cutting wider. It's, it's the width of your cut that produces the depth. So to make a wider cut, you need to be able to move uh, longer a longer chip. To move a longer chip, you need a thicker axe. And to make a thicker axe bite the wood, you need a heavier head and a longer handle. So that's why I changed axes. This is a bigger axe. Trees used to be felled like this way long after saws were common. And the reason is that a tree felled with an axe is easier for horses to pull because it has a point on the end. Now, if you look how the wane goes, it's higher here and it's lower there. Same at the butt. And this is clearly the bad place. So to make the best timber, I'm gonna roll it towards me. I can handle it, I think. But we're gonna have to lift it. That's, that's what's really gonna get it. The real fancy skill of this kind of hewing is the skill to chop off the stump absolutely flat so it supports one end of the tree. And I knew a guy who specialized in it and he was proud of it. And I guess since he's gone, I probably should, but I'm not going to. I think this one needs to be higher because of these rocks. So if I lift, can you shove? Yeah, let's see if we're level. High on Dan's side, high on my side. High on Dan's side, okay? Oh, I'm perfect. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay, now the, you're leveling Bob again to flatten right. each side. If this top is horizontal, yes. then I'm free to make the sides vertical and the timber will be square. All right. That's that's the theory. 
Yes. And my suggestion is, if you're learning to do this, if you want to do this, is that you operate by theory, mm -hmm. not not do it exactly the way I did it. Okay. Now, some someone could 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 you also do it with a square? Yeah. Off the flat side, Dan, or is that less? It, more or less efficient? Or? Well, you could do it with a square off the flat side, except that unless you knew that one arm of your square was horizontal mm -hmm. or one arm was vertical, you couldn't hew it straight. Right. You couldn't use the plumb bob. Yes. And you'd have to hew it with the square. Yes. And the answer is sure. Mm -hmm. You could tip it up to 30 degrees and use a square. Yes. But you're trusting this surface to be consistent on every eighth of an inch, the thickness of your square. Yes. And it's not. It's right. gonna rock. Okay. If you wanted to plane this surface, no problem. Then you're doing then you're doing carpentry. Yes. With well, the plane surface you can do it. So I wouldn't recommend it, but the answer is yes. And you notice what I was doing was I was putting a two by four across there and making a wider Right, so you're you know, taking the variation on a, the surface. A wider registration surface as it were. So we have, well, again, we're marking the center. Now, I'm not making any, any uh, judgments about the log at this time. I'm just marking the center of the wood at each end. Like that. And then I'll stretch my string. I guess I got it in my pocket. And again, let me repeat that I depend on a string pattern, which is the loop always goes at the butt end. And I always wrap to the outside, which if, there's, if it's in the middle, I use the road side, the road goes there. And that way, I know where my string actually is if I have to replace it. Now I look down the string, and the first thing I can see, and you can see it too, is that we're way off right here. The log bumps in here. Now, in order to get better wood here, I'm going to have to move the whole beam over to, uh, to the far side, the road side there, which I will do as much as I dare. But it's a matter of compromise and a matter of feeling. And that's why I use big nails. And that's why I use long ones, so I can do that. The part of the wood that's nearest the nail gets mo the most motion. So I can go down here, and I can move this one this way. And I can skew the whole timber in the log to make it better. I can go a long way here. And we're still good. This is looking very good. I think we've probably got it just about here. My tendency is to go a little farther here. I don't see why not. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't mind Wayne. The roundness is Wayne. A wheel maker is a Wainwright. Uh, as long as I have maximum strength. Okay. The corners don't matter. And to get that, you yeah. want to stay as much in the center of the log as possible. Yeah. Not only that, but I want to favor the weak places. Mm -hmm. And I can spot weak places by that new growth up there, you know, that's moved. Mm -hmm. And that's not as strong as butt wood is, can be compromised because it's very strong. I see. And you can spot weak places in the timber. And that's what the center line is for. Okay. Now, now uh, as a weak place. Um, could you point out a weak place to us so if we'll, we have one in this log? Well, that's not great, of course, but it's mm -hmm. all right. Right here, so, here, and here, where it starts to go, and you're going to be joined around here too. Mm -hmm. And you don't want a lot of sapwood in your joint where it's going to get eaten by bugs and so forth. But this area here is probably the weak area. Mm -hmm. This timber should end here. This should be a 16-foot timber or something. Mm -hmm. It uh, just this is the so tree. and working with 18 foot oh, yeah. because that's what we're yeah. replacing. Yeah. And you, you have to fell trees by guess. And we could give you 20 out of here if we needed to. Mm -hmm. And you could still use it. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of, uh, of uh, what you have. Now this is the common thing we're doing over and over and over again 
is we're using the level to show us where the point is. And rather than the nail. Okay, I got it. Okay. These can go in fairly far because we're not going to bend them around much. Good side. Okay. Got it. Okay, and now we will move one of our strings. Okay, now we can look at it again. And we gotta do two things. And they go together. One is to make sure that it is eight inches. And it is, could be a little wider. The next question is to make it a little wider, which one do we bump? We still have a possibility, we still have a chance to move our timber a little bit inside the tree. But you can see there's a kind of a white, white wood here and a white wood here. And that's the wood that's living, it's known as the sap wood and the yellow wood in the center. And the yellow wood is the most resistant to uh, being eaten by bugs and the, and the strongest and will dry the best and so forth. That's the dead wood. And we want to get rid of as much of the outside wood as we can. But it looks like what we have here is about the best we can do. So it's time to snap lines. <laughs> so I got to come through you here to get space. So if sapwood is taken off green from the right tree and worked properly, it can be quite magical stuff. But in a beam, which is gonna dry, it ain't no good. Well, I'm gonna do something fancy. No, I don't know. I think I'll just snap it and check it. And it's very typical for a timber to be out a little bit towards the ends when they're like this. This is perfect. This came out all right, but it's a surprise. Yes. Now, what I would normally do if I wasn't doing this on video is I would snap both lines. Yeah. But the nails are there, and I can snap the next one anytime. So the line is here. And in a way, we are now back to where we started. And we're really, in a sense, done. What I have to do is I have to score this, and you've seen me score. So we begin by taking out the knots. There's the knot. And now we do that all the way along. And then we score between the knots two or three. And then we break out the chips. And that's rough hewing. And then we trim. And you've seen us do that. And when we're done, this ought to be an eight by eight, square and straight. So this is a finished beam. And one advantage to working like this is when you come to take the beam out of the woods, it's as light as it can possibly be. And very often, a timber will be left in the woods for a while to dry out and get unsticky and uh, become even lighter. And when that's done, one end is always put up higher than the other end, so the water will run off it. And that's how I've left this timber. Now, if you look down there, I guess you can't, but there's the rest of the tree is down there, and there's even a, uh, a little person on it. And down here, of course, that's the stump that the tree, that the timber came from. Now, 
you can see very clearly that the heartwood is more or less in the center of the beam, or as done as best as I could. And this white here, this light color is a sapwood. And down here, you see, this is where the tree began to go to a top. And this is the poorest part of the beam. And it's where it has to be, but we've done our, we've done our best. And this is one advantage to a hand-hewn beam, is a hand-hewn beam is stronger than an ordinary beam the same size that's just sawn square out of a tree because it's intelligently chosen to have the strength of a tree. And if you've ever looked at the roof of a New England barn, you'll see the roofing kind of go like this. And that's because the beams are so strong that they could be put eight feet apart, but the boards between them sway. And this it's because of the hand-hewn beam that the uh, New England uh, traditional building is the way it is. It's very, very strong, but not particularly stiff. The beam, like the tree, can bend under the weight, but won't break. over that sleeper, huh? That's it. No more scores. <laughs>